Hey guys, welcome back to the Red Coat History YouTube channel. And we've got an episode of the podcast today, but I'm doing it slightly differently. This is more video friendly. It's going to be an InVision read and you're going to see graphics and information popping up on the screen next to me. So let's get cracking. I'm looking at an engraving, a picture of turbaned artillerymen. They're fierce and a determined looking bunch. One of the cannon has just fired and is wreathed in white smoke. The other is being repositioned, its crew sweating and straining. One of the men stares towards the enemy. I can't tell if his face shows fear or, or focused determination. Either way, his eyes are blazing and hypnotic. The guns are mounted on a large wooden platform and are placed behind sandbags. In front, heavy oxen stand ready to pull the platform to a new position while behind, a large elephant with terrifying tusks raises its trunk threateningly. This was the sight that greeted Colonel Clive and his small British force at the Battle of Plassey on the 23rd of June, 1757. It's an unnerving scene and I know that, that if I had stood in the British ranks on that day, I would have been desperately wondering what the hell I was doing in this distant and exotic land so far from home. But we're getting ahead of ourselves the Battle of Plassey is still in the future. The fight for dominance in Bengal is far from over. Welcome to the third and final episode of season two of the Red Coat History Podcast. If you've missed episodes one and two, then I do urge you to go back and listen to hear all about the inglorious fall of Calcutta and the infamous black hole affair that followed. You'll hear about a drunk sailor capturing an impregnable fort single-handed sort of, and a vicious artillery duel between the British Navy and the powerful French batteries at their base in Chandanagar. The French in Bengal are now beaten, they're no longer a player. Chandanagar is in British hands. Robert Clive, one of the most interesting and complicated characters in British history, is looking to continue his campaign and finally crush the local Nawab, Siraj Ud-Daula. Ad but can he do it? The Nawab's army is huge, well equipped and well financed. The East India Company can only muster a couple of thousand men, but they have something else on their side, and it's something that could prove decisive. After Clive beat the French, the Nawab is now very nervous and unsure of himself. He congratulates Clive on his victory, while desperately negotiating with the French to support him against the British in a class he knows is inevitable. In a panic, he sinks ships in the Hooghly River to block it and to stop Admiral Watson's boats from attacking his capital at Murshidabad. He positions his army along likely routes of advance to block Clive and his men. But it has to be said, he underestimates the British willingness to engage in double dealing and chicanery. Robert Clive had many great traits, but straight talking and honesty, I'm sorry to say, aren't amongst them. Through his agents in Chandanagar, William Watts and Omichand, Clive has found his inside man to help overthrow the Nawab. His name is Mir Jafar. He's a nobleman and a senior commander in Siraj Udaula's army. He is also willing to lead a coup against the Nawab, who seems to have been growing increasingly unpopular amongst his own people. But the Bengal court is a bizarre and Byzantine place with everyone out for themselves and willing to do whatever it takes to get rich. Indian historian Tapan Chatterjee says, Though Clive's brains had brought it to maturity, this was really a Hindu conspiracy. In those days, with the exception of the Raja of Birbhum, all of the big zamindars of Bengal were Hindus. Under Siraj Udaula, their suffering had been endless. Almost all of these noblemen, chief among whom was Raja Krishna Chandra Rai of Nadia, were secretly implicated in the plot. In wealth and position, Raja Krishna Chandra was second only to the Raja of Birdvan, and it was said in those days that any Brahmin of Bengal who had not got a grant of freehold at his hand could not be a true Brahmin. Now, I'll be honest, I think that's very much Indian internal politics, and some of those terms are a bit beyond me for now, but I think you get the idea. Let me carry on. Mahatab Chan was now the head of a rich banking house of Jagat Set and was in the top rank of all the big merchants of Bengal. 
Though this family belonged to the Jain community, the Jagat Sets, having lived for generations in Bengal, had been absorbed into the local Hindu society. Mahatab Chand was forced to put up with daily indignities at the hands of Siraj. Insult after insult was heaped upon this premier banker of Bengal by the capricious Nawab. Siraj ad went so far as to threaten him openly with circumcision, an outrage which no non-Muslim could be called upon to endure. Jagat Set now opened secret negotiations with the English through his agent Ranjit Rao. On the side of the English was Omichand, who was now spending most of the time at Murshidabad. Having made money, he was now treading the dark alleys and bypaths of politics. Meanwhile, to ward off suspicion, he had not altogether thrown off his cloak of the merchant. So that's all a little bit confusing, but Chatterjee, the author of that, makes a really important point here, that as foreigners we shouldn't underestimate. Through modern eyes, we see Indians versus a foreign invader, and wonder why anyone would side with the British, but it isn't that simple. For example, the Nawab was a Muslim, and a large proportion of his subjects were not, and many men had become rich through trade with the British and would lose everything if that came to an end. Even his army was full of mercenaries, ranging from Afghan infantry to European gunners and Persian cavalry. These weren't men inspired by patriotism, but the simple need to earn money and make a living. Very few of them would be willing to fight to the death for the Nawab. All of this double dealing amongst the bankers and the ruling classes soon led to a secret treaty being signed between the British and the Indian conspirators. Not surprisingly, the treaty included massive cash gifts for all of the signatories. And here is also an interesting story that may help to shine some light on the sort of characters we're dealing with. Omichand, the merchant and British agent in Mashidabad, was clearly even greedier than many of the others involved. In fact, he demanded to receive 5% of all of the Nawab's treasure in exchange for his signature, a huge amount of money. Clive and the others were disgusted by his demands, but they needed to keep him sweet. His involvement in the conspiracy was very important. Therefore, Clive had two copies of the treaty drawn up. A red copy included Omichand and his exorbitant fee. A white copy made no mention of him. Obviously, the red copy was sent to Omichand to sign, while everybody else signed the white copy, which was now seen as the real one. It was signed in secret by everyone. It was a classic scam that, in fairness, seemed to work. The only signatory who refused to put his name to the fake one was the ever-dependable and honest naval commander, Admiral Watson. His scruples didn't matter, though, as his signature was quickly and easily faked by the others involved. Meanwhile, with a final showdown looming, Clive began to strengthen his force. Invalids and some gunners were left to garrison Calcutta. A detachment of sailors were requested and 200 arrived. Half were left to man the walls of the recently captured Chandanagar and the other half marched with Clive. On the 13th of June, 1757, Clive's army began its march north towards the Nawab's capital. Imagine an army on the move in that era, the noise, the excitement, the smells. As had become the norm on this campaign, the European troops with the ammunition stores and artillery travelled up the river on 200 boats while the hardier sepoys marched along the right bank. Their first major obstacle was the fort at Kutwa, an earthwork with eight round towers and 14 guns. Our old friend Air Coote, who you may remember from the last episode of the 39th Regiment of Foot, had now been promoted to the local rank of Major and was detached with 200 European troops and 500 sepoys to attack the place. The local commander of Kutwa had previously expressed his willingness to hand it over to the British, but now he changed his mind and decided to put up a fight. Things quickly went wrong for Coote and his men. The river was deemed too shallow to bring the guns ashore at the right place. And then, as Coot and a small escort moved forward to recce the enemy positions, one of the men, probably a sentinel called Moses Ford, suddenly fell ill, making so much noise that he drew heavy fire from the fort. With musket balls cutting up the ground around them, Coot ordered a withdrawal. Things didn't seem promising. 
God, that's almost farcical, isn't it? Imagine doing a recce right under the nose of the enemy and one of your guys suddenly falls ill and starts making a, a whole hell of a lot of noise. That wouldn't have been pleasant. On the 19th, Coot finally ordered the attack and he himself takes up the story. I formed the whole of my force into two divisions, the Europeans making one and the sepoys the other, and I gave the orders to Mutenbeg, who commanded the sepoys, to march on very briskly, cross the river and lodge himself under the opposite bank, which was about 30 yards from the fort, and from there he was to keep up a continuous fire while the Europeans crossed the river a little higher up. On our advancing, the enemy fired some shot without effect, and I could perceive them running out of the fort, which we immediately entered and found 14 pieces of cannon and of different calibers and a quantity of ammunition. And so the fort fell easily after all and the road to Plassey was now clear. But the rain, which can be heavy and incessant in this part of India, had other ideas. The column was forced to wait for two more days in Kutwa. It was a nerve wracking time and the deluge seemed to set Clive thinking, stretching his nerves. He called a council of war and spelled out his reasons for now wanting to halt the advance and dig in until after the monsoon season. He was nervous of the Nawab's large army. Not only that, but the French weren't completely dead, there was still a small force of them close by. He also didn't have a lot of trust in the conspirators within the Nawab's army, Mir Jafar, the senior commander and a signatory to the secret treaty. Recent letters from him had been irregular and vague. Would he side with the British after all? or renege on his promises. A lively discussion took place. Air Coote of the 39th was the principal hawk. He detailed his reasons why he felt immediate violence of action was the best course. Firstly, he knew that morale was good, the men were in high spirits, and any delay could affect their fighting ability and confidence. He was also aware that the army was far from Calcutta and that it would be close to impossible to maintain good communications and supply lines if they dug in and stayed here at Kutwa. Clive won a close vote to dig in. But then an hour later, probably with Coote's good advice ringing in his ears, he changed his mind and ordered that the column be ready to move in the morning. Sanity had prevailed and Clive realised that all of his success so far had been built on speedy and decisive action, not digging in and handing initiatives to the enemy. At sunrise on the 22nd of June 1757, the army crossed the Hooghly River close to the recently captured fort and advanced along the bank. It rained constantly, long and heavy, turning the track into thick clinging mud that left the soldiers exhausted. Eventually at around midnight, the soaking wet men reached a large grove of mango trees and stopped for the night. But any sense of relief was quickly pushed aside as the thumping of drums and music made it clear that the enemy were close. They were just a mile from the main Bengali force that was entrenched and prepared for them further along the river. It was a precarious position to be in. The Nawab's army massively outnumbered them by more than 10 to 1. Not only that, but the Nawab's troops were dug in with heavy cannon and the British still didn't know if Mir Jafar was with them or against them. Anchoring the British left flank on the river was a royal hunting lodge, which was referred to by the British as Plassey House. Here Clive positioned 500 men with two guns overnight, though he withdrew most of these in time for the battle. As the sun broke, Clive climbed to the top of Plassey House and saw the Nawab's army, vast in numbers, with huge scarlet robed elephants, their standards fluttering in the gentle breeze. They filed out of their camp and spread out across the plain ahead of him and around to his right, almost encircling his small force entirely. Exact figures seem to vary, but there's no doubt that the enemy numbered over 50,000 men. It must have been a hell of a sight. The historian Orm describes the scene. The greatest part of foot were armed with matchlocks, the rest with various arms, pikes, swords and rockets. The cavalry, both men and horses, drawn from the northern regions, were much stouter than any that serve in the armies of this region. The cannons were mostly of the largest caliber, 24 and 32 pounders, and these were mounted in the middle of a large stage, raised six feet from the ground, carrying, besides the cannon, all the ammunition belonging to it, 
and the gunners themselves who managed the cannon. These machines were each dragged by 40 or 50 yoke of white oxen, and behind each cannon walked an elephant, trained to assist at difficult tugs by shoving his forehead against the hind part of the carriage. The infantry and cavalry marched in separate and compact bodies. Clive, on the other hand, could only muster around 3,000 men, about 2,000 of them being Indian sepoys of the Madras and Bengal armies. The rest, a mix of white company troops, artillerymen and naval detachments under the command of Lieutenant Hayter, and of course our stout fellows of the 39th Regiment, later known as the Dorsets, whose motto was Primus in India, first in India, as they were the first royal troops to serve on the subcontinent. It seems to me that the obvious thing at this point would have been to keep a tight perimeter based on the mango grove and the hunting lodge, and wait for the Nawab's army to attack them. But Clive knew how battles in India were won. They were as much psychological as anything else. You could not afford to show timidity. You had to seize the initiative and be bold. Therefore, Clive ordered his army out onto the plain and drew them up in line. His sepoys were on the flanks, with the white troops in the centre. The Europeans were divided into four subunits, commanded by Majors Kilpatrick, Grant and Coote, as well as Captain Guap. G-U-A-P-P, -P, I think that's pronounced Gwap. Chatterjee takes up the story. On the Nawab side, 200 yards in front of the English, the French gunner Sinfrey had taken up his position beside a small tank. With him were about 40 French artillerymen and four light field pieces. Just behind them were the Nawab's crack troops commanded by General Mir Madan, while on his left, drawn up in battle array, was the Kashmiri Mohanlal with 5,000 horse and 7,000 of foot. The rest of the Nawab's army stood on a high mound by a discarded brick kiln. Apart from these, at a little distance away from the main body of the army, stood in a semicircle to the right of the English, Rai Durlabram, Yard Lutf Khan and Mir Jafar, each with his own brigade. The village of Plassey could be seen immediately to the south of them. By the way, what Chatterjee calls a tank, and other historians refer to as an eminence, was essentially an embankment around an artificial pond that formed a small hill of sorts. From here, the French began to bombard the redcoats. Major Air Coote was positioned right centre, commanding the Bengal Europeans he'd been detached from his own regiment. He's left us with the following description of the battle. The enemy began to cannonade so briskly that it was advisable we should retire into the grove where we formed behind the ditch that surrounded it, our left being covered by Plassey House, which was close to the riverside. By the way, if you've heard my podcast before, you know that's my generic posh accent. It's not a very good one, I'm afraid. Still, it's better than my Indian accent, which is why I don't try and put one on. <laughs> the initial Bengali bombardment had killed and wounded 30 British and Indian redcoats, forcing them back behind cover to wait for a decisive attack. But the attack didn't come. Instead, the Nawab's troops brought forward more heavy guns to try and sustain their advantage in firepower. But the British troops were simply ordered to sit down and the balls went flying over their heads, shattering the trees behind them, but inflicting few casualties. Then, a heavy tropical storm suddenly swamped the battlefield. One of those heavy Indian downpours that can feel like the end of the world is coming. It turned the fields to mud, and the Nawab's artillery suffered from wet gunpowder, their weight of fire immediately slackening. Assuming that the British powder would also be wet, some of the Nawab's cavalry under Mir Madan made a dash for the grove, but were forced back with heavy casualties. I guess it seems the British did a better job of protecting their powder from the elements. The English fire was so heavy that both Mir Madan and his son-in-law Badri Ali Khan were hit. Air Coote continues. In this situation, we cannonaded each other till 12 o'clock, when the colonel came from Plassey House and called the captains together to hold a council of war. But changing his mind, returned without holding one. The cannonading continued on both sides till about 2 o'clock, when we could perceive the enemy retiring into their lines, upon which Major Kilpatrick marched out with his division and took possession of the tank the enemy had quitted. Here the colonel joined him and sent to the grove for another detachment, upon which I marched out and joined him with my division. 
What Air Coote rather tactfully left out of this story was that Clive was initially livid with Kilpatrick for advancing without orders. But once he arrived at the tank, he saw that it had been the right thing to do. It was the dominant position on the battlefield. The enemy seemed to be needlessly withdrawing back to their trenches, handing the British the best ground and giving up any chance they had of victory. So what, what had happened? Why had the enemy retired despite being in such an advantageous position? Well, a large part of that is due to the death from wounds of Mir Madan. He had been wounded by a shell splinter in that attack on the British and then bled out on the floor of the Nawab's tent. Siraj ud Dawula was already mentally quite weak and watching his most loyal subject die in front of him was the last straw. He quickly called for Mir Jafar, yes that Mir Jafar who secretly sided with the British, handed over command to him and rode off the field of battle on a borrowed ca camel with his private escort of 200 mounted troops. It was a terrible decision, the troops needed their commander with them. With Mir Madan dead, they needed to be inspired to launch a fresh assault. Instead, the Nawab handed command to a man who had been colluding with the British for a long time. Chatterjee continues the story. It was only here that anything in the nature of severe fighting occurred. The Nawab's men fired their muzzle loaders with such speed as they could command, but their antiquated weapons were of no use against Clive's guns. Besides, no one knew who was leading the Nawab's army. Each man fought as best as he could according to the dictates of his fancy. Whatever else one might gain in this manner, one certainly could not win a battle. Emerging from the trenches, the Nawab's soldiers were unable to reform their lines. For want of proper guidance, the horses, draft oxen and ammunition wagons advanced too far, became bogged in the mud and completely screened the fighters. A single shot from the English guns killed off a hundred animals at a time. But the Frenchmen fought like the devil. As they noticed the Nawab's men coming out from behind them, they poured fire on the English with renewed vigour. Reading this account, I can't help but question how vigorous the French and Indian fire really was. After all, it didn't inflict many casualties. British platoon volley fire of the era, though, was deadly and seems to have broken what was left of the fighting spirits of the Nawab's troops. Coote picks up the story. The Colonel, Clive, then sent the King's Grenadiers and a Grenadier company of sepoys to lodge themselves behind a bank that was close upon the enemy's lines. From hence they kept up a continual fire with their small arms, as we likewise did from four pieces of cannon from the tank. Perceiving the enemy to retire on all sides, I was ordered to march into their lines, which I entered without opposition. Even the French artillery, which had fought a good fight, realised that they were on their own and pulled back withdrawing to safety. By 5 p.m. one of the most important battles in British and Indian history was over. Captain Arthur Broom, in his excellent History of the Bengal Army, says of Plassey, The success was rendered more complete and positive by the arrival of messengers from Mir Jafar Khan, to which Colonel Clive replied by requesting a meeting the following morning at Dawoodpur. The troops, being informed that they were to receive a liberal donation in money, welcomed the order to push on to Dawoodpur with hearty cheers, notwithstanding the fatigue that they had already undergone during the last two days, and the temptation to plunder that lay spread around them. A short halt was made to enable the commissariat to take possession of a sufficient number of the Nawab's splendid oxen, to replace the inferior cattle in their own artillery and store carriages, but a detachment under Major Coote was sent on at once to pursue the enemy and prevent any attempt to rally. And by eight o'clock the whole force reached Dawoodpur, where they rested for the night. The loss of the British in this action was remarkably small, amounting to seven Europeans and 16 sepoys killed, and 13 Europeans and 36 sepoys wounded. Of the Europeans, six of the killed and ten of the wounded belonged to the artillery, on whom the brunt of the action rested. Two officers of that arm were also wounded, but their names are not recorded. These were the only officers who received any injury, with exception to Mr Shoreditch, a midshipman of the Kent, also attached to the artillery who was shot in the thigh. The loss of the enemy amounted to about 500 killed, and an equal proportion wounded, including several of their officers. Three elephants and a number of horses were also left dead on the field, and 53 pieces of cannon. The whole of the baggage camp, equipage, stores and cattle fell into the hands of the victors. 
Thus was fought and won the famous Battle of Plassey, which may truly be said to have decided the fate of India. And so it was. Suddenly the small group of British upstarts with a handful of troops had defeated one of the most powerful men in India. Chatterjee also sums up the importance of this battle perfectly when he says, Witnesses to the Battle of Plassey have long since been dead. The mangrove grove with its hundred thousand trees is now lost in the depths of the river. Even the hunting lodge has been washed away. The field of Plassey does not exist. There's a new Plassey village in place of the old, but the river no longer flows by it. It's changed its course a long way off. No one regards the fighting that took place as Plassey as worthy of the name battle. Rather, it has been described as an armed demonstration. The English who fought at the Battle of Plassey have nowhere described it as a great conquest. Some call it a revolution, others a revolt. Nonetheless, it was as a result of this fighting that a handful of tradesmen gradually exchanged the yardstick for the scepter. Though they did not begin to rule at once, they held the fate of Bengal in their hands. It was the English merchants of Calcutta and not the Emperor of Delhi who now decided who should sit on the throne of Bengal and who should vacate it. Clive entered the capital of Murshidabad just six days later and Mir Jafar was quickly named as the new Nawab. As for the old one, after a brief spell on the run he was captured and sadly stabbed to death by Mir Jafar's son on the 2nd of July. A squalid and inglorious end for a man who had tried his best to stop the British gaining power in India but had fallen short, underestimating the skill and bravery of that thin red line of red coats. He wasn't the first and he won't be the last to make that fateful error. But it's probably worth pausing for a moment here before we wrap up the season and asking, so seriously, how did a handful of British troops and local sepoys manage to destroy a huge native army so easily, time and time again? Yes, of course, there's double dealing and greed. Many local commanders were easily brought off, but it wasn't just that. Men like Clive were excellent commanders, but most of all, they understood their enemy. They took huge risks and gambled the lives of their men because they knew that the armies opposing them lacked moral co cohesion. There was no esprit de corps. Many of them were mercenaries. They followed their unit commander rather than the Nawab. Act strong and make noise and they would start to lose confidence. But also tactically, British drill and their devastating platoon fire with the brown best musket was superior to the tactics and weaponry employed by their adversary. European skill at arms were just too much for an enemy that were often armed with outdated and ineffective weaponry. And so what became of the individuals we've discussed in season two? Well, Air Coot of the 39th, who's one of my favorite characters from this story, as you probably realized, went on to have a very lively and successful career. He commanded the 84th Regiment at the decisive Battle of Wandiwash, also in India, and then in 1763, on his way back home to England, he met and married the governor's daughter in St. Helena. His Indian service, like many, seems to have filled his pockets, and he purchased a large country estate in Hampshire. But his time in India still wasn't finished, and he returned again to become commander-in-chief of the company's forces in India. He's a man we may meet again in future episodes of the Redcoat History podcast. Clive himself, well, you've probably heard a lot about him. He became super rich thanks to his double dealing and willingness to accept gifts for favours. In 1762, he received a peerage. He's still a controversial figure, either a hero or a villain, depending on your political point of view. But one thing that can't be denied is that he knew how to fight and how to lead men in combat. And for the sake of this podcast, that's all that matters. And so that brings us to the end of season two of the Redcoat History podcast. It's a short season, but I hope you found it interesting. It was fun for me to research and write it. And I want to explore India more in future seasons, which is why I wanted to lay this foundation stone by looking at the Battle of Plassey. So guys, please do follow me on social media where I'm at Redcoat History, all one word. I'll be posting updates there about season three. At the minute I'm still torn, but I think we're going to start diving into the Napoleonic era. Also, I just want to point out, if you didn't know, that my interview that I did with Rob from British Muzzle Loaders, I've now turned into a PDF, an illustrated PDF, that you can download from my website. 
Just go to www.redcoathistory.com to find out more. You just sign up for my newsletter and you get emailed a free copy of the PDF. Anyway, it's Saturday here and it's time for a gin and tonic in the mess before heading out for a spot of pig sticking this afternoon. Uh, it promises to be a wonderful weekend. Whatever you're doing, enjoy it. Make it worthwhile and remember your ancestors, men like Clive, Air Coot, and even our old friend Strahan of the Royal Navy are watching and need to be sure that you're living a life worthy of their memory. Because if you're not, what was the point of their sacrifices?